This video is starting Module 3, Inputs and Tools, Chapter 4, Microeconomics for the CFA Institute Investment Foundations Program. So we're starting Module 3 here, Inputs and Tools, and you can see within Module 3 there are five chapters, Microeconomics, Macroeconomics, e uh, Economics of International Trade, Financial Statements, and finally Quantitative con uh, Concepts. So Module 3 makes up 20% of the CFA Institute Investment Foundations program. That translates into 24 questions, roughly. And uh, there's 50 learning outcome statements in this module. So for example, in Chapter 4 that we're looking at in this video, there's 11 uh, learning outcome statements. So again, if it's 20% of the exam and you're targeting 100 hours to study, then you would um, estimate that this section would take uh, 20 hours to study and you can see that there are 291 questions in the learning ecosystem so I've added another column to my little chart here uh, because when we're heading into a module like this where there's five chapters I just wanted to break out and show exactly how many questions in the learning ecosystem per chapter so for uh, microeconomics you can see that there's 53 questions and this is where you're going to be spending uh, a large part of your time uh, with regards to studying the chapter. Now I just wanted to point out one thing and it's uh, with regards to uh, what we might want to call efficiency. We can see that uh, module 3 is 20 percent of the exam yet it has five chapters, 291 practice questions, where if we look here at module 5 for industry structure which is also uh, 20 percent of the exam so translates into uh, 24 questions as well there's uh, you know only 27 learning outcome statements for the module and there's only 96 practice questions so this just brings up uh, one of the points that I sometimes like to make with regards to efficiency if you're pressed for time there's a whole bunch of content here uh, that you need to go through and probably might take you more than the 20 hours uh, you know 291 practice questions that will only translate into 24 questions here you've got 96 practice questions that also translates uh, only into 24 questions on the exam 27 learning outcome statements so in terms of efficiency what I always like to tell uh, candidates and students is make your strong areas really strong and if you're pressed for time just make sure that you're doing a decent uh, job of covering the materials you're not expected to get perfect on the exam. You're targeting to try to get over 70 in every area, but uh, obviously people are going to have different strengths and weaknesses. So uh, just wanted to point out that we're heading into a module here that has got a lot of learning outcome statements. There's a lot of reading, uh, a lot of practice problems, but at the end of the day is 24 questions uh, on on the exam. So my again, my final advice. Uh, is make your strong areas really strong and uh, other areas just make sure uh, you're getting through them and uh, not spending too much time watching your time budget okay here are the 11 learning outcome statements for chapter 4 module 3 microeconomics learning outcome statement a define economics b define microeconomics and macroeconomics c describe factors that affect quantity demanded D. Describe how demand for a good or service is affected by substitute and complementary goods and services. E. Describe factors that affect quantity supplied. F. Describe market equilibrium. G. Describe and interpret price and income elasticities of demand and their effects on quantity and revenue. H. Distinguish between accounting profit and economic profit. I. Describe production levels and costs, including fixed and variable costs, and describe the effect of fixed costs on profitability. J, identify factors that affect pricing. And finally, K, compare types of market environment, perfect competition, perfect monopoly, uh, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly. Learning outcome statement A, define economics. Economics is the study of production, distribution and consumption, or the study of choices in the presence of limited or scarce resources. Individuals and organizations have numerous wants, 
An individual may want to buy a new automobile, to have more leisure time to pursue a hobby, or to be able to retire early. A city may want to build new schools, better recreation facilities, or a bigger industrial park. Resources to meet these wants, labor, real assets, financial capital, etc., are often limited or scarce. There are finite resources available in the economy to individuals and organizations. Therefore, individuals and organizations have to make decisions regarding the allocation of scarce economic resources. Learning outcome statement B is define microeconomics and macroeconomics. Macroeconomics is the study of the economy as a whole. For example, macroeconomics examines factors that affect a country's economic growth. So what are the factors that affect the economy as a whole? Uh, this chapter focuses on the factors that influence the supply and demand of goods and services. Supply refers to the quantity of a product or service sellers are willing to sell, and demand refers to the quantity of a product service buyers desire to buy, a product or service buyers desire to buy. Knowing how microeconomics affects a company's revenues, costs, and profit is vital to understanding the health of a company and its value as an investment. So here in microeconomics, we're looking at what factors affect decisions made by firms and individuals. Learning outcome statement C is describe factors that affect quantity demanded. So the first thing is that uh, demand refers to the quantity of a product or a service buyers desire to buy. And it's logical that if the price of a product goes up, then consumers will normally buy less of a product, which leads us to the law of demand. And the law of demand uh, states that quantity demanded and price of a good are usually inverse related. So as the price of a, of a product or service goes up, positive price increase, then there would be a uh, less amount uh, quantity demanded, which is a negative. So you can see that the quantity demanded and price of a good are usually inversely related. Uh, if the price goes down, then the quantity demanded would go up. So here, if we had a negative uh, price adjustment, the quantity demanded would go up, which would be positive. So again, law of demand, quantity demanded and price of a good are usually inversely related. So continuing with learning outcome statement C, describe uh, factors that affect quantity demanded. So this is the example uh, from the textbook. It's looking at a demand curve for pizzas per week at various prices. And you can see, first thing that we want to see is that it's a downward sloping curve. So as the price decreases on the y-axis, the uh, x-axis, the quantity demanded increases. So individuals satisfy wants through the choices they make regarding scarce resources. Economists term the satisfaction of want as utility. Utility is a measure of relative satisfaction. Consumers derive utility or satisfaction from eating pizza. So according to the law of diminishing marginal utility, the marginal extra satisfaction consumers get from eating each additional unit of pizza diminishes as the total amount uh, eaten increases. So a consumer may enjoy eating one unit of pizza in a week, but eating a second unit of pizza typically brings less satisfaction than eating the first unit. So as the satisfaction diminishes for each additional pizza unit demanded, it follows that the buyer will be willing to pay only a lower price. So the demand curve shows the quantities of pizza that a consumer is willing to buy at various prices over a given period, holding all other factors constant. Note that the demand curve slopes downward from left to right, indicating that as the price of pizza decreases, the quantity uh, the individual is willing to buy. So we could see here at a price of $2.20, uh, you're looking at wanting to eat three and a half pizzas. Or at a price of uh, $2.40, we're looking at um, quantity demanded uh, being three pizzas, okay? So uh, if, a, if the price of a pizza changes, there is a change in the quantity demanded, which is uh, represented by a move along the curve. So one of the things that we're going to look at is movements along the curve, and movement later on we're going to look at actual movements of the entire demand curve. 
So you can see the important point here is that it's uh, if the price changes, then there's a change in the quantity demanded, which is a movement along the demand curve. So as we pointed out, for example, here at a price of $3, uh, the individual demands two units of pizza. But as the price decreases, you can see to 240, you can see that it increases to uh, three pizzas, okay? So note that uh, only that when, on, when the only thing that changes is the price, the quantity demanded changes, but the demand curve itself does not change. Changes in the demand curve are based on uh, factors other than the price of the product or service. And uh, one of the things that we're going to look at, the big driver of changes in uh, that uh, moving the, the, the demand curve would be income. Incomes, uh, families and individuals, uh, societies go up or it goes down. If uh, income is rising, then you would expect that uh, for each price, the quantity uh, demanded at each uh, price level is going to increase if uh, income. So income is a factor. So just jumping into the uh, learning ecosystem in the ebook here, exhibit three in the chapter illustrates how a change in a factor that has made the product more attractive shifts the demand curve to the right from D to D1. Uh, so we can see uh, we're going to take a closer look at the major factors that affect the demand curve. So you can see the first thing is the effect of income on demand. So a change in demand for a product resulting from a change in purchasing power is called the income effect. If the price of a product decreases, consumers will have more purchasing power. That is, although their income is unchanged, consumers can afford to buy more. Thus, the quantity of products purchased may increase. Uh, however, a change in consumers' income may shift a product's demand curve. So for most products, called normal products, if income increases, demand increases too. Meat is an example of a normal product in most emerging economies. However, for inferior products, the relationship works in the opposite direction. That is, demand for inferior products decreases as income increases. Grain is often considered an inferior product, so when incomes are higher, people consume, uh, consume more meat relative to, uh, to grain. Recessions offer an example of when uh, demand for inferior products increases. During a period of decline in economic activity, consumers tend to switch to lower cost brands and shop more at discount stores than at department stores. So during recessions, investors may focus on companies that sell inferior products to identify stocks that may perform better. Just a quick graphic on the effect of income on demand, normal goods versus inferior goods. So we can see as, in, as income increases, the demand for normal goods should increase, but the demand for inferior goods will decrease, okay? And this is measured by income elasticity, which we're going to discuss later in the chapter. Here we're looking at two other factors that affect uh, quantity demanded. So the first thing we looked at is uh, income. But uh, another factor that can affect quantity demanded is future prices. So for example, if consumers expect that the price of rice will increase as a result of a shortage of raw materials, the current quantity demanded may increase as consumers accumulate rice to avoid paying the higher price in the future. And a, another factor that can affect quantity demanded is uh, general tastes and preferences. So for example, if a report was published that linked eating chocolate to better health, demand for chocolate may increase. Learning outcome statement D is describe how demand for a product or service is affected by substitute and complementary goods and services. So on here we're looking at uh, substitutes uh, and here we're looking at complementary goods, okay? So according to the substitution effect, if the price of a sandwich increases, the price of a substitute product, perhaps a pizza, uh, appears to be less expensive. So the price of a sandwich relative to the price of a pizza is now higher so a consumer may demand a greater quantity of pizzas. So here we can see the price of the sandwiches going up. Well, I'm going to buy less sandwiches, perhaps. I'm going to have a, uh, a slice of pizza for lunch. So the substitution effect is when consumers substitute relatively cheaper goods for relatively more expensive ones. Over here, we're looking at complementary goods. 
Uh, complementary goods or, co or complements refer to goods that are frequently consumed together. When the price of a complementary product decreases, it will lead to an increase in demand for that particular product and for complementary goods. So here we're looking at a decrease in the price of ink cartridges for uh, 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 ink printers. And so it'll increase the quantity demanded of a complement, which is printing paper. So uh, ink has become less expensive. I'm doing more printing. I'm going to demand more paper. So that's a complementary uh, good. In another example, if you like peanut butter and banana sandwiches and the price of peanut butter decreases, you may not only buy more peanut butter, but also more bananas. Moving on now to learning outcome statement E, describe factors that affect quantity supplied. So now we're looking at the supply curve and the supply curve represents the quantities supplied at different prices. And you can see that it's upward sloping. So if we're looking here at supply curve S at uh, this price, this is the uh, quantity supplied. Of course, we always have price on the Y axis and quantity supplied on the X, okay? And as you increase the price, you could see here that the quantity supplied uh, would also increase. So there's a positive relationship. So the law of supply states that when prices increase, the quantity supplied will increase. And uh, next we look at shifts in the supply curve. So moving the curve from S to S1, and that occurs in response to factors other than the price of the good or service uh, changing, such as changes in production costs, technology, and taxes. So for example, if uh, there were changes that would decrease the production costs, then that would shift the supply curve and for each price uh, it would increase the quantity supplied. Continuing with shifts in the supply curve, so recall that on the y-axis we've got price and on the x-axis we've got quantity. And uh, the supply curve is upward sloping and so we're going to look at three factors here that can cause shifts in the supply curve. The first factor is production costs, the second is technology, and the third is taxes. And all these factors can result in shifts in the supply curve either to the left or the right, not movements along the curve, okay? So the first, uh, looking at production costs, increased production costs will result in reduced supply at every given selling price and it will shift the uh, supply curve to the left. So here we're going to mark that as S1, meaning that the company is willing to offer the same quantities at higher prices or equivalently smaller quantities at the same price. Okay, so here we could look uh, going across the price at the same price here, the, uh, the company is willing to offer less quantity. Okay, if production costs decrease, a company will increase production for any given price and the supply curve will shift to the right. So this would be S2, okay? So increase in production costs, shift to the left, and in, uh, decrease in, in uh, production costs, shift to the right. So again, it's gonna be the same for both technology and taxes. If there's a new technology that reduces production costs, then it would be a shift in the supply curve to the right. Again, if we looked at decreasing taxes, that would shift the supply curve to the right. If we increase taxes, it would shift the supply curve to the left. Learning outcome statement F is describe market equilibrium. Market equilibrium is a state in the market when at a particular price, no buyer or seller has any incentive or desire to change the quantity demanded or supplied, all other factors remaining unchanged. So as illustrated by the exhibit on this slide, the interaction between the demand and supply curves determines the equilibrium price of the product, okay? So we've got our demand curve here, downward sloping, our supply curve, upward sloping, and you can see here where they intersect at this price, it's the equilibrium uh, for the uh, quantity demanded, okay? Uh, price and quantity, where, it, where <coughs> the equilibrium price is the price at which the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied, okay? So at any price above the equilibrium price, suppliers are willing to supply more of a product than consumers are willing to buy. A price that is higher than the equilibrium price may result in increasing inventories, 
which could then lead to suppliers cutting prices to, uh, to reduce their inventories and thus move prices back to the equilibrium price, okay? Um, uh, conversely, if prices are below the equilibrium price, consumers will demand more of a product than suppliers find profitable to produce and inventories will be depleted, which then allows suppliers to raise prices and increase production. The only price at which uh, suppliers and consumers are both content with no desire to change the quantity produced or bought is at this equilibrium price. Moving on now to learning outcome statement G, describe and interpret price and income elasticities of demand and their effects on quantity and revenue. So this slide, we're looking at the price elasticity of demand and we've got a formula here, the price elasticity of demand equals the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in the price. So you can see in both the numerator and denominator, we're looking at percentage changes. So in this example, if a 10% decrease in the price of cars leads to a 15% increase in the quantity demanded, then the price elasticity of demand for cars is negative 1.5. If a hotel room, second example, uh, a hotel room prices increase by 10% and the quantity demanded decreases by 20%, then the price elasticity is negative 2.0, okay? So it's more elastic. And um, uh, this approach, so the effect is to remove the unit of measure, it's unit free, uh, as our other elasticity concepts, we're looking at the percentage change in demand resulting from a percentage change in price. And uh, when we're looking at elasticities, there's the two elements that matter. Number one is the sign. Is it positive or negative? And what is the magnitude? In the previous slide, we calculated the elasticity, own price elasticity for cars as a negative 1.5 and for hotel rooms is negative 2.0, which means that if the price went up, then the uh, quantity demanded was gonna go down, uh, or if the price went down, the quantity demanded was gonna go up. And we can see in both cases, it was less than negative one, which means those products and services uh, are negatively highly elastic, which means for a given percentage change in price, that's the denominator, uh, the numerator, the quantity demanded, will change by a greater percentage. So the change is in the opposite direction. That's why we have the, uh, it's, an, it's a negative. So if the uh, own price elasticity equals negative one, then it's negatively unit elastic. So for a given percentage change in price, the quantity demanded will change by the exact same percentage. So what that means, if the price of cars went down by 10%, then the quantity demanded would increase by 10%. It's equal, so it's negatively unit elastic. And if it's greater than negative one, but less than zero, it's negatively inelastic, meaning for a given percentage change in price, the quantity demanded will change by a lesser percentage. This change is in the opposite direction. So uh, using the same example, if the price of cars went down by 10%, the increase in the quantity demanded would be, would be by a lesser amount say uh, 5%, okay? So we would have uh, a number that is uh, greater than negative one and less than zero. You could see that uh, that would be 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.10, and that is a negative and that's a positive. So that would equal negative um, 0 0.5, okay? So that is an example of negatively inelastic. Clicking on to the next slide, we can see here that now we're uh, calculating above zero. So if it's greater than zero, then less than one, we're positively inelastic. So for a given percentage change in price, the quantity demanded uh, will change by a lesser percentage. And the change here, this is important, it's in the same direction. And if the, uh, if the own price elasticity equals one, positive one, it is positively unit elastic. So for a given per, uh, percentage change in price, the quantity demanded will change by the same percentage. And again, it's in the same direction. That's why we're getting the same sign. 
And then finally, I think you're getting the hang of this, that if its uh, unit own price elasticity is greater than uh, plus one, then it's positively highly elastic. And so for a given percentage change in price, the quantity demanded will change by a greater percentage and it's in the same direction. Again, there's 53 questions in the learning ecosystem to practice. So I just wanted to pull one out just uh, to check our understanding. Here's a good practice question. Which of the following statements best describes price inelasticity? A small change in price produces uh, A, proportional change in demand, B, less than proportional change in demand, or C, disproportionately larger change in demand. Okay, the correct answer is B. If price elasticity is low or inelastic, changes in price are accompanied by less than proportional changes in the quantity demanded. This means demand is not very price sensitive. So here you can see just from the previous uh, two slides, I cut and pasted the uh, definitions for negatively inelastic, which is for a given percentage change in price, the quantity demanded will change by a lesser percentage. So this question wasn't asking about negative uh, uh, inelasticity or positive in inelasticity. It's just talking about price inelasticity. And if it's price inelastic, then for a given percentage change in price, the quantity demanded will be uh, changed by a lesser percentage. So very important, I just I like to throw in a couple of practice questions here and there to show you that as you're going through the material, it's so important to go back and uh, check your understanding through doing as many practice questions as possible. So now we're moving on from own price elasticity to cross price elasticity. Okay, so cross price elasticity is the proportional change in quantity demanded of one product in response to a proportional change in the price of another product. So here, uh, so you can see the numerator again, percentage change in quantity demanded of good one, resulting from a percentage change in the price of good two. Okay, so again, numerator denominator, it's looking at percentage changes, and the uh, numerator is quantity demanded, and uh, the denominator is a percentage change in price, but now it's not own price, it's a cross price elasticity. So here, if we're looking at this first example, it's looking at a uh, 5% uh, positive price change in, in uh, the price of coffee result in a negative 7% change in the quantity demanded of cream. And so it's a negative increase in price was a decrease in quantity demanded. And the negative means that it's a complementary good, okay? Uh, an increase in the price of one is usually accompanied by a reduction in the quantity demanded of the other. So another example would be tea and sweeteners in certain economies. So conversely, a positive cross price elasticity of demand characterizes substitute goods. So we can see here we've got uh, uh, a positive number uh, resulting from a, a, a percentage change in the price of coffee has gone up has uh, resulted in a positive percentage change in the quantity uh, demanded of tea. So you can see it's clearly a substitute good. If the price of one good goes up, then I'm gonna increase the demand for a substitute good, okay? Uh, so it depends on how close a substitute the product is for the other product. Um, note that this positive number indicates that the uh, goods are substitutes. Coffee and tea can be substitutes for some people, but not for all. Thus, there will be some cross price elasticity, but it might not be a high number. So alternatively, Coke and Pepsi may, may be considered closer substitutes, and the cross price elasticity would be larger. So again, I just picked a practice question right out of the ecosystem just to check our understanding. And I'm choosing this one because I just want to point out to the first time you uh, read through some of these economic questions, you know, they can be a little bit confusing. Which of the following pairs of items most likely has a negative cross price elasticity of demand? So that sounds fairly intimidating. And the choices are, is it A, DVD players and DVDs, B, cable TV and satellite TV, or C, landlines and uh, cell phones. So uh, what we remember from the previous slide is we want to check whether the goods are complementary or whether they are substitutes, correct? And then uh, what, we, what we wanted to then remember is what is the sign if the goods are complementary 
or if they're substitutes. If they're substitute, it's going to be positive. If they're complementary, it's going to be a negative. Okay. So remember, it's the uh, it's the it's always in the in the uh, numerator. The uh, the percentage change quantity demanded of good one from a percentage change of the price of good two. Okay. So if the price of good two went up and the quantity demanded of uh, good uh, number one went up, then it means they're substitutes, uh, and it's going to be positive. And if the sign was negative, it was going to be complementary. So here we want to pick up on the key word. It's just negative cross price elasticity. So I know it's negative. I'm looking for the complementary goods. So what complements each other here? Cable TV and satellite TV? No, those are substitutes. Landlines and cell phones? No, those are substitutes. I'm looking for complementary, the negative. So it's going to be A, DVD players and DVDs. And so again, from my uh, flash card or cue card that I'm going to make, I, it's going to, I'm going to call it price, pros, uh, uh, cross price elasticity. And I'm going to have a big positive here with substitute, a big negative, and it's going to be complementary. And that's how I've uh, memorized. And these questions then become fairly easy okay it's just into a cue card that's got a little graphic and a couple of bullet points and if i remember the formula i can sort of think my way through it so again with regards to the economics looking at some of these terms negative cross price elasticity of demand well uh in fact it boils and simmers down to a fairly uh, easy concept so there's the uh, solution that I cut and paste from the learning ecosystem into my slide. And you can see A is correct. Negative cross uh, price elasticity indicates complementary goods. So that's all we're looking for. Negative, complementary, positive, substitutes. And that's it. And then we went through A, B, and C and determined whether they were complementary goods or a substitute. And uh, I just want to show you that economics becomes easier and easier with just a little bit of practice. Just wanted to do another quick practice question from the QBank. In this one, it's showing a demand and supply curve, and it's talking about the shift. The question is the shift to the right in the demand curve for an item from D to D1 is consistent with a decrease in A, production costs, B, the price of a close substitute, or C, the price of a close complement. Aha, so here we're talking about substitutes and complements again, but we're not talking about own price or cross price elasticities demand, we're looking at a shift in the demand curve. And again, I put this question in here following the last one, just to show you that again, we're talking about substitutes and complements, but in this case, we're talking about a shift in the demand curve. So if I look at the first A, production costs, no, wait a minute, production costs shifted the supply curve to the left or the right, okay? Increase in production costs was shifting the supply curve to the left, decrease was moving it to the right. So it's gotta be B or C. And so, uh, so let's just uh, work our way through it. Don't be intimidated by looking at graphs and all the intersections and movements and curves. It's just saying that an increase in demand uh, for a, a product or service consistent with a, a decrease in the price of a substitute or the price of a complement. So if, the, uh, if, the, if there's a decrease in the, in the price of a close substitute, so if the uh, price of Pepsi goes down, do you think the price, uh, the demand for Coke would go up? No, I don't think so. But if it's the price of a close uh, complement, so if the price of peanut butter went down, would I think the quantity demanded for jam would go up? Yeah. So I would think that the correct answer is C. So again, just wanted to use this practice question to illustrate a couple of points. Don't be intimidated by the curves, the graphs, the intersections. Just walk your way and talk your way through it, okay? And you'll see that the right answer uh, should come out fairly logically. And indeed we are correct. C is correct. A shift to the right in the demand curve is consistent with increased demand for the item. So this shift is likely to rise if the price of a close complement declines. In this example, for uh, example, hot dog buns are a close complement to hot dogs. So a decrease in the price of hot dogs should lead to an increase in the demand for both hot dogs and hot dog buns. And uh, just a quick thing, what else could shift the curve to the right? Other factors for demand is income effect. So if income was to go up, we would also see that demand curve shift to the right. So now we're moving on to income elasticity of demand. And you can see the formula for income elasticity of demand 
in the numerator we've got percentage change in quantity to demanded uh, that hasn't changed but in the uh, denominator we've got percentage change in income now so before we we're looking at price elasticities and we looked at own price and cross price elasticity we're in the denominator we're looking at a percentage change in price either of the same good or a different good now we're moving on to income elasticity of demand okay so uh, this value is a measure of the impact of changes on income on quantity demanded when other things such as the own price of a product and the prices of related goods are held fixed most goods have positive income elasticities meaning as consumers in, uh, income increases they purchase a greater quantity of the product so here we can see the normal goods and it's a positive it's above one we can see that for the po uh, pr positive uh, change in income uh, there will be a positive change in the quantity demanded that's a normal good and if it's above one that really means that we're looking at luxury goods so as the percentage change in income increases the percentage change in the quantity demanded is even more than that so in that case if income went up by 10 percent and um, the quantity demanded went up by 11 percent we could see that that is greater than one that is a characteristic of a luxury good on the other hand here in for, uh, inferior goods is um, if a consumer purchases less of a product as in income increases then the income elasticity is negative and the goods are called inferior goods so let's say that income has gone up by 10 percent but the quantity demanded has gone down by two percent that's a negative we can see that it's uh the the, the sign is going to be negative and that's a, an inferior good income elasticities enable investors to distinguish between luxuries and necessities a luxury product will usually have an income elasticity greater than one whereas a necessity will have an income elasticity of approximately zero demand will not change uh, in income so inferior goods and luxury goods uh, items have their own considerations the most commonly cited example of inferior goods are such staples as potatoes or rice as consumers income increases they substitute more expensive and desirable goods such as fish and meat luxury items for which the income elasticities are greater than one may include foreign travel and golf club memberships notice that this definition is conditional because income elasticities will change for the same products such as for cars computers and various leisure products as a society's income improves learning outcome statement h is distinguished between accounting profit and economic profit profit is the difference between the revenue generated from selling goods and the costs of producing them the remainder can be thought of as a company's profit uh, accountants and economists however differ in how they measure profit consider the owner of a restaurant in France so we're going to go through this little example so for a particular period the restaurant had revenues of 5 million euros and they had explicit costs of 3 million euros so the accounting profit which considers only explicit costs is the 5 million in revenue minus 3 million of explicit costs so we've got a accounting profit of 2 million dollars and so uh, 2 million euros sorry and explicit costs are employee salaries utilities product costs advertising expenses etc our normal uh, income statement economists however take a broader view of co costs and deduct implicit costs from revenues to arrive at economic profit the owner risks her capital by operating the restaurant if it fails she will lose all her money so she could have used her skill and risked her capital differently for example assume that she could find employment investor capital and and have a return of 1.6 million euros these would be the implicit costs the return on the owner's capital risk of capital uh, value of the owner time etc so we calculate the economic profit by looking at the accounting profit which was the 2 million but we're going to deduct the implicit costs of 1.6 million euros so we have got an economic profit of 400,000 euros so in summary to calculate accounting profit only explicit costs are considered whereas in economic profit both implicit risk of capital entrepreneurship skill compensation etc and explicit costs are both considered 
Now we're moving on to learning outcome statement I, which is describe production levels and costs, including fixed and variable costs, and describe the effect of fixed costs on profitability. So uh, one thing that we need to look at here, uh, the y-axis is total costs. And um, on the x-axis, we've got the number of units, okay? And you can see that uh, we're starting at a base of fixed costs, and within a certain range of uh, number of units, those fixed costs are assumed to not change to be constant, okay? So companies combine labor, capital equipment, land, and managerial skill to produce goods and services. Costs associated with property, buildings, and equipment, rent, insurance, interest, and wages for salaries uh, for a basic level of labor force are fixed costs. They don't change in the, in the short term over a, a certain range of output, okay? <clears throat> costs that fluctuate with the level of output of the company are termed to be variable costs. And in many cases, this could be, um, you know, an example would be raw materials. I have a factory that makes cookies. As I increase the number of cookies that I'm making, I'm going to increase the amount of flour and sugar. Uh, so as you would expect, as I increase the number of units, the number of cookies, my total costs are going to increase. Some of it's going to be made up of my fixed costs. And then the rest is the variable cost, uh, the cost per cookie. And that gives me my total cost. Now this is a nice to know, not a need to know, but for those of you that like uh, math, you can see that this the equation for this curve, the total cost curve, is just y equals a, which is fixed costs, uh, plus b, which is variable costs, times x. So this is VC, I'll just save a bit of space, variable costs, and this is my number of units. So again, uh, the formula for this uh, curve just y equals a plus bx. So total cost equals fixed cost plus the variable cost times by the number of units that are produced. And so the last thing that uh, we need to know is sometimes we refer to the average cost and the average cost is just the total cost divided by the number of units. So here it's saying if you produce one unit the total cost is the fixed cost plus the variable cost for one unit but if you produce a hundred units the average cost would be the total cost divided by the hundred, the number of units. So now we're moving along. You can see here that uh, the y-axis is my cost and my x-axis is my number of units. So that hasn't changed. And uh, remember, if I, I can see that my total cost is starting there. So if I draw a straight line across, this would be my fixed cost. And then this would be my variable cost. And so my total cost, y equals a plus bx, fixed cost plus uh, variable cost times the number of units. So what's changed in this graph is we've added a line for revenue. At zero number of units, I've got uh, zero revenue. But as I start to sell uh, more units, I'm going to increase my revenue. And you can see the break-even point is where my total costs equal my total revenue. So revenue minus costs uh, gives me zero. That's my break-even point, and it's a break-even. We can calculate a break-even in terms of number of units. After that point, my revenue is greater than my total cost, so I'm starting to make an accounting profit. Okay. On this slide now, uh, what we're looking at is that it's valuable to point out an important economic principle um, regarding the law of diminishing returns. Okay. And so, uh, for example, suppose a factory has a fixed number of machines and hires additional workers to operate them and make more goods. Total output may uh, rise quite rapidly at first, the first area of increasing marginal returns. So we can see here, adding a bunch of, uh, a couple of new workers, the total output is really going to decrease a very steep part of the curve. Increasing the marginal returns, total increases, total output increases rapidly. But then we're getting into uh, diminishing marginal returns. Total output increases, but, as a de uh, but at a decreasing rate. And finally, we get to uh, stage number three here, where actually adding uh, more workers gives you negative marginal returns. The total output actually decreases. Okay, So, of course, in the long run, all factors of production can be changed and some costs that are regarded as fixed uh, become variable 
because a company can relocate its facilities or purchase new equipment, and some costs such as advertising may be fixed, but they're also discretionary, meaning that the company is not committed uh, to the use of those goods or services, okay? So in general, the law of diminishing returns, gains from adding variable inputs increase at a decreasing rate until full capacity is reached. Uh, having employees work overtime increases labor costs and production. Okay, two more slides with regards to this learning outcome statement. I just want to point out this first sentence is a very important one. Now we're looking at operating leverage, okay? The effect, of, and this is uh, talking about the effect of fixed costs on profitability. So companies with high fixed costs relative to variable costs have high operating leverage. So you gotta memorize that. High operating leverage means companies with high fixed costs relative to variable costs. So double star that, very important point. So for example, if production levels are very low for a steel mill, a factory plant that produces steel, the fixed costs are massive relative to the revenues and the steel mill will make a low profit or even suffer a, a loss, okay? So it has high operating leverage. As production increases, variable costs will increase as, as a result of using additional inputs to the steel making process. But the total cost per unit of steel produced will decrease because average fixed costs will fall and the steel mill will become increasingly profitable as output rises and its fixed costs are spread over more units. So the most important thing here, just to understand, high operating leverage means companies with high fixed costs relative to variable costs. So the last slide for this learning outcome statement is looking at maximizing profit. And the amount of money a producer receives for an additional unit is known as its marginal revenue, okay? And uh, the general rule is that marginal cost or additional price per unit can be increased up to the point where uh, that it equals the marginal revenue. So producing at the point at which marginal revenue equals marginal cost will in theory maximize profit. So that's just the important thing to understand from this slide. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. That's the maximizing point uh, for a company. Producing to the point at which marginal revenue equals marginal cost will in theory maximize profit. So now we're looking at learning outcome statement J, identify factors that affect pricing. So we're getting down to the last two learning outcome statements and the last three slides. It's been a bit of a longer video than we might like, but uh, lots to learn with regards to microeconomics, okay? So factors that uh, affect pricing, here we've got uh, four factors. Number one is supply. Does it have a, a unique characteristic or not? Uh, another factor affecting pricing is demand. If demand is greater than supply, competing goods will uh, benefit. Number three is income and levels and elasticity. That'll have uh, impact on pricing. And finally, industry structure, which we're gonna look at over the next two slides uh, uh, to finish the last learning outcome statement, also is a factor that can affect pricing. So now we're down to the last learning outcome statement K, which is compare types of market environment, which is perfect competition, pure monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly. So there's four industry structures here uh, spread over the last two slides for this um, uh, topic, okay? So uh, this would be exactly how I would probably set up my own flashcard. I would have perfect competition, pure monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly all on one uh, flashcard. And I would have some of the key words or key terms that are um, <clears throat> associated with that categorization. So with regards to perfect competition, there are many buyers and sellers trading at a uniform commodity. So that would be something like a uniform commodity would be something like sugar or oil, okay? There's little or no barriers to exit and there's no single buyer or seller can affect the market price. That's perfect competition. When we contrast that to a pure monopoly, it's a single company that produces a product for which there are no close substitutes. So in the old days, if you looked at the 1960s uh, in Canada, for example, the province where I live, Ontario, the telephone company Bell Canada had a pure monopoly because it was the single company that offered you a telephone line into your house. Now, of course, that's changed. You've got uh, cell phones and different uh, telecom providers 
in the same market but in the old days it was very expensive to uh, uh, install phone lines so it was a government regulated uh, utility okay a telephone company and there are significant barriers to entry and that would uh, a lot to do with in the old days would would have been cost okay so it's a single company produces a product for which there are no close substitute and there are significant barriers to entry if we move to monopolistic competition the uh, characteristics that we need to pick up on again there's many buyers and sellers but because of product differentiation they're sold at a range of prices and there's no major barriers to entry okay and finally oligopoly is a market dominated by a small number of large companies because the barriers to entry are high so there's a small number of large companies similar product or service and uh, large barriers to entry so that might be something like uh, oil companies okay and uh, buying your gasoline from one of the uh, oil company distributors okay so it's it's the uh, market is dominated by a small number of large companies because the barriers uh, to entry are fairly high and that is the uh, last slide for the last learning outcome statement I know it's been a bit of a long video but uh, that's the way it goes with microeconomics there's a fair amount of content uh, to be covered that is the conclusion for this video on module 3 inputs and tools chapter 4 microeconomics of the CFA Institute investment foundations program now the most important thing to do is to get into that uh, uh, learning ecosystem after you've uh, done your readings and practice those practice questions as much as possible when you get it wrong look at the solution and go back to the text and make your own flashcards etc and good luck with that thank you